So tell me, how important do you think, as, as a diplomat, as a former diplomat, has this week been for Israel? Um, well, look, it's a difficult time, and uh, it certainly was not a great week. That's an understatement. And, uh, and Israel apologized repeatedly for the, the World Central Kitchen disaster. It was obviously an awful mistake, and, uh, and Israel uh, is working to fix it and to make sure that things like that don't happen again. So Jose Andres, the founder of uh, World Central Kitchen, you know, was very adamant when he said this wasn't just a mistake. This, they, they were targeting these people. They were hunting them down effectively in these three vehicles, uh, one after another. Um, so where was the mistake made, do you think? Was, it, was the mistake made in the idea of thinking they were you know, hitting someone else, Hamas operatives, or perhaps it wasn't a mistake? No, I think that, that, that the IDF has been pretty uh, open, and in fact, m- more open than most about its investigation. It shared it with uh, ambassadors from all of the, the, from the different countries. It shared it with, uh, with uh, friends in the United States and the UK and around the world um, and said that uh, there was uh, bad intelligence, there was mm. a mistake, and it was wrong. And, uh, and it's an awful tragedy, and I certainly don't want to say anything less than that. But I think it's interesting that Israel, I think different than certainly the vast majority of, of our region and in other mm. wars in the world, say, taking, taking on responsibility, saying we want to fix it. When Hamas kills people, Israelis or Palestinians, they celebrate and give out mm. candies. I never heard any apologies for, for taking hostages or raping women. No, sure. And, and I think that's absolutely right. I guess the problem is this, that Israel wants to be held, you know, wants to compare itself to, you know, d- democracies in the West, like the United States or Britain or Germany, um, where there is due process, there's a degree of un- accountability, you know, you have freedom of the press and so on. And, and so to say that you're better than Hamas or you're better than, you know, the government in Iraq or better than the Syrians, is not a big deal, frankly, is it? Well, you're, of course, you're 100% right. Our standards are not those standards. Our standards are your standards. Um, and, uh, and we want to behave in a way that, uh, that gets the respect of our friends in the UK or other places in the world. Um, it would be wonderful if people were paying attention to yesterday as the last Friday of Ramadan, where tens of thousands of people quietly prayed at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Mm. Quiet, peaceful, good. That should be a story, but, uh, alas, because of the horrific event earlier in the week, um, that's what we're talking about. I mean, you talk about the scrutiny um, regarding this latest attack on the foreign aid workers. You know, there are plenty of people, you know, in this country and elsewhere, and especially in the Gaza Strip, who say, you know, when 200 Palestinian aid workers were killed in airstrikes or targeted by drones, no one kicked up a fuss. I mean, other than their immediate families or people in the Palestinian community. And that's just fundamentally unfair, isn't it? Um, Look... (laughs) There's, there's, there's too much that's unfair to everybody in every direction you need to look in my neighborhood. But we know that there's a path to a ceasefire. Israel, again, um, accepted the, the proposals of the mediators and agreed to terms of a ceasefire and a return of hostages for, I think, the fifth time over the last month, Hamas rejected it. And so when in the international community says, we want a ceasefire now, I have to say, I'm with you sitting here mm. in Tel Aviv. I want a ceasefire now. And the path to it is getting the 134 Israelis out of Gaza and stopping the firing and, 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 and stopping on all sides. And that's what Israel's offering. And Hamas again and again rejects it. So again, you call for ce- one, one calls for a ceasefire and then, quote unquote, blames Israel because we're the West and we're, you know, a phone number you can ring up. I, I, there's sort of a disconnect there. Yeah. I mean, talking of disconnects, and I've made this point before, what seems to have happened kind of quite early on in this conflict is that, you know, one side is just talking about suffering on their side. So, you know, people who are pro-Palestinian, or Palestinians themselves, much of the Arab world, you know, many, many people in this country or the United States just focus on what Israel is doing in the Gaza Strip. And if you're in Israel itself, and I spent six weeks there after October the 7th, you hear very little about the suffering at the receiving end of IDF weaponry, but you, you hear a lot about the hostage families, understandably, and the suffering and the trauma caused inside Israel. And because you never see both pictures at the same time, it is virtually impossible to come to some sort of common ground. Well, that may be so. And, 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 and you know, and some people say that in Israel, it's still October 7th. And uh, that it's never changed over. And you may think the calendar says 
April on it, but for thousands and thousands of Israelis, there's a vulnerability mm. that people here feel that is no less now than it was in October. Um, that said, um, there is empathy for Palestinians, for, for innocent civilians, when we have hit innocent Palestinians. That's a tragedy. That's a mistake. That something went wrong on the Israeli side. For our neighbors, for our, for not for all Palestinians, but mm. for, for Hamas, that's things going right. That's exactly what they're looking to do. And Israel has that problem yeah. in the south in Gaza, in the north with Hezbollah. The Iranians are just spending money and effort in every direction to try to somehow suck all of us, and not just Israelis, mm. into this uh, massive regional cultural war. And uh, there has to be a path out. But as a former diplomat, one more brief question, and then I want to go to my next guest, but please don't leave the line because I want to get back to you at the end as well. Um, as a former diplomat, do you now feel that Israel, because of the way it's been conducting the war in Gaza, is more isolated than it has been for a very long time? And ultimately, that's detrimental to your future security. Yeah, I think that you can't argue with that point. I think that that's true. And and, 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 and some of that blame is on Israel. But is it self-inflicted? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you're answering that question. No, 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 no. To, to, be, to be sure, Matt, I think that that's true. I think that we've made mistakes. But I think at the same time, um, perhaps there's a fatigue internationally. Mm. And because nobody can <laughs> influence Hamas, maybe other than Qatar, um, but they don't. Yeah, and uh, and so the only direction, the only person that that uh, that that uh, the British Prime Minister or somebody else can vent at who will answer the phone is us, and so I, mm. I get that, and then and then Israel's got to find our way out of it. Okay, Arthur Lenk, stay there, please. Let's bring in Magnus Corfix, and he's the humanitarian lead for Oxfam. Magnus, good morning to you. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Um, do you think it's fair that it's taken seven foreign aid workers to create that degree of outrage in the international community that forced President Biden to pick up the phone and actually threaten military sanctions, when actually the 200 Palestinian aid workers that have been killed over the last six months have got barely got noticed by the outside community? No, I don't think it is. I think without a doubt the it was a tragedy what happened on, on Monday night, but unfortunately not an isolated incident. And and as you mentioned, we've seen more than 200 humanitarian aid workers being being killed in Gaza. Um, and this is something that, that I would say the humanitarian community have tried to highlight since the escalation mm. of the conflict. Um, the, the targeting of, of humanitarian aid workers, their premises, convoys, is unfortunately something we've seen uh, since October. Um, but of course, like it's what has happened since Monday, and we've started. Then hopefully, we've heard from what the Israeli authorities have mentioned in terms of opening the the port in Ashdod. The border crossing in Erez is, of course, very much welcome. But 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 still, there is a sense that this comes very much late, um, considering the vast humanitarian need to cross Gaza, yeah. where more than two million people are in humanitarian need right now. Of course, I think immediately after the attacks, uh, a, a big aid ship that was heading from Cyprus to Israel, to Gaza, you know, loaded with tons of aid, turned around because people were afraid that once they actually make landfall in the Gaza Strip, their people, their operatives would not be safe. How quickly can you turn this current situation around, given that the Eretz crossing is now open and the, the port is operational in Ashdod, in order to supply... 300,000 people or so in the northern Gaza Strip with the aid that they desperately need in order to avoid famine? So right now, it's really important to understand that there is nowhere that is safe inside Gaza right now. And it doesn't really matter if you're a humanitarian actor or, of course, if you're a civilian or if you're a health professional. Everywhere inside Gaza right now is extremely insecure and unsafe. So all humanitarian workers and Gazans in particular are running extreme high risks, ensuring that they are at least trying to address some of the humanitarian needs right now, while them, themselves being affected by, by, by this escalation in conflict. In terms of how quick the turnaround is, right now there are kilometers of trucks waiting at Rafa, Rafa border crossing to, to enter Gaza. So we can turn this around swiftly. Humanitarian actors together with the UN, we know how to, to respond to this kind of crisis. Of course, it's unprecedented, but trucks are prepared to, to enter. But right now, 
the the border crossings are taking too slow. Um, we only have two crossings open as of the moment: uh, Karim Abu Salem or Karim Shalom, as well as uh, Rafa. So we'll have we'll have to see what what it actually means once the the Erez border crossing is opening as well. And it should not be at the expense of mm. any of the other border crossings because the trucks are there, the coordination mechanisms are there. And that's why it's crucial that humanitarian actors, UN actors are part of the planning and operationalization in terms of getting assistance into Gaza. It cannot just be between Israel and and bilateral agreements, being it with the US or, or other other of their allies, it has to be led by humanitarians. One of the reasons given by Israel for not letting the many trucks, you know, across the border uh, post at, at Rafah is because they claim that Hamas steals the aid that is shipped in by the international community. Is there any evidence to suggest that that is happening? Not as far as we are aware. We know, of course, that the situation right now is desperate. Um, there is an acute need of food. Um, the reports that came out last last month uh, of the IPC stated that 1.1 million people are food insecure at a catastrophic level. And that means that famine is imminent especially in northern Gaza, where 300,000 people are currently trapped um, and living off less than 245 calories per day since January, on average. That's less than a can of beans. Mm. Compare that to what's needed for, for any, any human being, which is 2,100 calories. This is critical. Mm -hmm. um, so the situation is desperate. Um, we've all seen like pictures of people trying to scramble around, like the little aid that's coming in being it by airdrops or by the sea or by road. And that's why we are advocating for that more aid is needed to go in because it is there and sure. it can happen. And uh, in order to also make this secure and to help a uh, humanitarian response at scale, that's also why we call for a permanent ceasefire immediately. Uh, if I can turn to you again, just at the end, Arthur Lenk. I mean, we talk a lot about the here and the now, how to avert famine, how to bring those aid trucks in, understandably, because those those needs today are very urgent. They're very desperate. But what about the future for the Gaza Strip? I mean, ever since I've you know start, started covering this particular conflict since October the 7th, this particular phase of a very long conflict, I've been asking the same question day after day. What's the idea? What's the vision for the Gaza Strip once, if these hostilities actually cease? And I wonder what your idea is. How does this look? I mean, does, who runs Gaza? What happens to, you know, 70% of the buildings that were destroyed? What happens the, to the 2.3 million people that used to call that place home? Yeah, it, of course, that's the right question. And I think that the answer is still to being debated. And it, we would all love, it would be best case scenario, if Palestinians could do it in a peaceful way and we can live in coexistence and security, both Israelis and Palestinians as neighbors. That's the goal. That's really in separate where we states, need to be. two state solution. Are you still a fan of that uh, idea or not? For, no, for, for, no, me personally, mm. absolutely. Yes. That said, the Israeli government is not wrong to say we haven't heard one Palestinian leader, not one, who said we want a solution of taking responsibility for security. We appreciate the fact that Israel has a right to live in security next to Gaza after everything that's happened in, 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 the, in the past months. Um, I, I, I hope, I pray for a time mm -hmm. where we and our Palestinian neighbors could live side by side in peace in a two-state solution, getting there. Uh, you know, so that's easy to say. Yeah. The question is, is, is where's the Palestinians who are going to take responsibility and, and, and walk with us and with everyone else to do that? I hope that that person is there and, uh, quickly. I mean, the fact is, isn't it, that the, from the river to the sea, this idea that you have one big state from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea is both being, you know, is a slogan for the Palestinians increasingly, but also for many Israelis. I mean, that, you know, I, I, hardly anyone I spoke to, frankly, other than foreign diplomats and perhaps yourself, still believe that a two-state solution was even possible. Well, it may not be possible in April of 2024, but I do think that a pathway, a place, place of hope, Obviously, getting our hostages home, getting Hamas, making making Gaza state for Palestinians from Hamas, are our mm. paths to get there. And uh, I think Israel knows how to make peace. We've made peace with Egypt. We've yeah. made peace with Jordan. We've had peace processes with the Palestinians. The question is, is are there people that we can work with? Mm. And obviously, we need a government 
that's willing to do that and sure. make the hard decisions too. Well, that yeah, indeed, that's another point. And, and we are reminded yet again of the massive demonstrations against Bibi Netanyahu on the streets of Tel Aviv, the city that you're in, uh, almost on a weekly basis. And also the fact that whenever there's we've reached, we've reached one of these really dark hours um, of politics between the Palestinians and the Israelis, that's when you get progress, uh, or indeed the Arab world and the Israelis. So after 73, you got the Camp David Accord. After the Intifada, you got the Oslo Accord. So maybe, maybe, hopefully, something similar will happen this time.